And I'm going to pass it off to uh, Rana. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, so my name's Rana, and I'm an assistant professor of um, gender studies at UC Davis. So I wanted to thank all the grad students and the COLA movement in general, um, and just uh, um, we're really appreciative of the event and the circumstances that brought us here. So that's um, that's good. I am a co-director along with Tim Choi, who I'm not sure is on the call yet or not, of Hatch, which is a feminist arts and science shop at UC Davis. The idea um, around this um, as a Mellon initiative was just to get feminist um, perspective, perspectives into thinking about science studies in general. So just to like think about feminist STS and do it in a way that was community engaged um, and that supported and kind of highlighted work that had been done in critical ethnic studies and in queer studies and in disciplines that were intimately involved in feminist STS and made it in, in some ways that didn't always, all the conversations that could be happening weren't necessarily happening. So we saw um, that as a way to, that was like kind of the meta level of it. And the other level of it was just to do community, to make it a space where certain kinds of questions that were of interest to the community um, could happen, science was very broadly defined in this, like extremely broadly defined. So we did a lot of, uh, we did a lot of work and have continued to do work with the people's community medics in Oakland, for example, but we've also had a lot to have uh, um, done a lot of work thinking about just the university as a structure um, in and of itself and how disciplines and knowledges are made um, in this space, given that it is a land grant university, given um, a lot of the things that we'll talk about today. So um, our panelists, I guess we would call them, are they panelists, is that it? Our roundtable for cis defense are, are um, a really uh, great group of people that come out of student organizing and grad school themselves. Like that's where I think we all know each other through student, for, through grad student organizing around labor and a bunch of other issues. Um, so Abby Boggs, I was a UC Davis graduate now at Wesleyan. Do you want to say any, maybe I should not introduce everyone. I actually would rather you do it in your own words. It seems weird for me to do it. So if you would like to just um, say something, or I can also, I can also um, say something if you don't want to about yourself, but. I can introduce myself. I'm fine I think with that. I'm seeing all this like Davis architecture in the background. It's very familiar and feels bizarrely far away. Um, so I finished up uh, the cultural studies PhD at Davis in 2013. Um, I was working with Karen Kaplan, who many of you probably know, and Omni al Shakri in history, and um, Beth Freeman over in English. And now I'm at Wesleyan in sociology, which is strange, and I'm happy to talk about how I ended up in the sociology department, even though my methods are kind of discursive analysis and critical theory um, coming out of cultural studies. Um, what else I do work um, along with the AUS project on uh, the recruitment and management of international students at US universities. So that's the, the book project that I'm working on that comes out of the dissertation. So I'm happy to think through kind of the implications of um, the transnational US university in this particular moment, which, which clearly is gonna have some bearing on things moving forward in ways that were not anticipated um, a couple months ago, or at least weren't largely anticipated. Um, yeah, that's kind of who I am and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for including us in your conversation. I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more about what's going on on the ground out there. Zach or Nick or Eli? I guess I've unmuted Zach for now. Okay, yeah, I can go next. Um, I'm Zach Schwartz Weinstein. I am an adjunct uh, currently teaching sort of um, uh, for a Bard College Prison Initiative, which um, is basically a liberal arts college run across six prisons in upstate New York um, that does a, a bachelor's um, uh, and associates program. Um, and um, I haven't seen any of my students since uh, March 15, 14th. Uh, which was the last day that that we were allowed to go in and teach in the prisons. Um, so that that's what I say when I say that I am sort of teaching. Um, I uh, I'm an American Studies scholar and a labor historian. I did my PhD at NYU with Rana a million years ago, um, and um, I work a, I, I work on the history of service labor in universities. And I am working on a book about the history of food service, custodial, and um, 
maintenance worker strikes at Yale in the 60s and 70s. Hey, how's it going? My name is Eli Meyerhoff. Um, sorry if you have trouble hearing me. I'm outside and it's kind of windy, um, hiding from my, my toddler who's inside with my, my mom right now. Um, most of the time I'm a uh, stay-at-home dad these days. Um, it's hard to find places to work at home. Um, I'm a political theorist, uh, but I work as a staff member at uh, Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Um, I wrote a book called Beyond Education. It's kind of a critical theory of education, lo looking at education as, as one, just one possible mode of studying among many alternative modes of studying. Um, yeah, and I'm currently doing a kind of abolitionist university studies research project on uh, universities' relationships with the tobacco industry, um, particularly in, in the Southeast, the, the Piedmont region. That's what I'm up to. And I'm happy to be in conversation with you all today. Hey, Okay, I think I'm unmuted now. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nick Mitchell. Um, I am faculty in feminist studies and critical race and ethnic studies at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I also did my PhD at UC Santa Cruz, so um, I can't get away from the place. Um, I work, generally speaking, on the history of mar minoritized, marginalized fields in US universities. Um, my book, which I'm hopefully going to be done with in the next, next two months uh, is on the relation between black studies and women's studies uh, formations in US universities since the 60s. Uh, generally, I'm interested in, in the political history of universities and universities as a problem and occasion uh, for thinking a broader organization of, of social problematics. Thank you all for the introduction. Um, and so maybe we can uh, jump right in and invite you all to just reflect on why abolitionist studies now, why abolitionist studies here at UC and in this moment. Um, and Rana and Tim, you too, if, um, as, as co-organizers of this, as Hatch, um, if you all have anything to add to that as well, that would be great to hear from you. Well, it looks like I am. I may be the one unmuted, so <laughs> I can I can get started. Um, I think that, that, that there's a, a lot of things to say, and a lot of things to say, especially like with regard to what we what we're talking about when we're talking about the now. Um, I I think that at this moment, um, you know, it's especially important to be able to think about abolitionist the abolitionist frame within the university of california system because um as you know i think i i probably only said this on twitter but like you know if you include students as workers um then the university of california is basically one of the the biggest employer in the country um outside of walmart um it has more more workers than amazon more than Target, McDonald's, UPS, Starbucks, etc. And like all of those other enterprises, the majority of the workers who are at those institutions uh, make wages that are, are at or below the poverty line. So when we reframe the question of universities within that context and without the kind of um, normative force 
of optimism that we are used to handling the question of the university with, without the, the kind of um, presupposition of upward social mobility that came to us through the idea of the university that was born into the Cold War and has not survived the Cold War, even if it was applicable, applicable in the context of the Cold War to the extent that was, uh, that, 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 that was accurate. And so I think that having the, the abolitionist lens first and foremost is about giving us the distance that doesn't necessarily obtain when we start our, our conversations about universities with the frame of optimistic optimistic analytics that we kind of um, that we get from many other projects of thinking of the university whether in our normative social discourses on it or whether in many many um, many critical frames that we've inherited that are both about critiquing the ways in which the university has been decimated by certain kinds of uh, privatization, by austerity logics, um, by various forms of institutional racism, by the Prop 209 in, in California, um, without going back to a kind of restorative discourse and thinking the university really on um, on terms that seem more accurate in representing what it is and the, 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 the histories that have um, moved through and animated the institution itself. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. I think other people might not be able to unmute themselves, which is yeah. the, the, the issue that people can't, uh, can't jump in. I am just doing that right now. <laughs> uh, there you go. Um, I mean, we just we got the prompt for this uh, conversation late last night, and we had a little bit of time to talk about the implications of abolitionists thinking about the university um, for the UCs right now I'll be in conversation about an hour ago. So we're, <laughs> we're just starting this conversation between ourselves. But, you know, we're thinking about what does it mean to think about the kinds of accumulation the university is participating in and enabling right now, which, of course, entails thinking about the long term history of kind of how the university has functioned as an accumulative technology um, for capital and for the state. But what, what will change now, right? What will come not inevitably, but as, as a result of what's happening um, with COVID. I think for me, I'm thinking a lot about international students and what's gonna, what the dependence of US universities, including the UC on international student tuition dollars on their diversity and non-human capital um, from international students is gonna enable the university to do in terms of pushing for a more globalized online form of education um, because these institutions simply cannot sustain themselves without those tuition dollars. So I think, even the schools that are going to say they're coming back to campus in the fall, it's not going to be possible to be wholly on campus really anytime, I don't think, in the next year, if not two years. And so how that's going to become an alibi for kind of reforming how the institutions work in a more long-term way is something I think we have to anticipate. Um, one thing we were talking about earlier is, you know, how do we anticipate the wins that we do get, right? Is this going to become an, a, a way to get, say, free college education for everyone in order to handle the number of surplus populations that are produced by not having employment. What form will that take? Is that going to be a form of education that is actually aligned with the kinds of commitments to education that many people here might have? Um, or is it going to be some kind of terrifying version of that, right, that we actually need to think about how we're going to interrupt it as it comes down the pike? Um, it's one thing that I was interested in our conversation earlier. Zach, did you want to jump in? Sure, yeah. I mean, a couple things that, that I've been thinking about um, are like, um, what are the ways in which um, the kind of shifts that we're seeing in how universities are conducting themselves, um, what are the ways in which uh, those new forms of, um, of instruction and, and research that universities are attempting to kind of shift towards, um, who gets left out? Uh, in those arrangements, um, what are the effects that those arrangements have on, um, you know, vulnerable populations, on racialized populations, on kind of um, uh, the kind of hyper exploited and hyper precarious populations that universities depend on, um, but rarely acknowledge um, in any meaningful way. Um, 
uh, and particularly, right, I'm thinking about uh, service labor. I'm thinking about the kinds of um, labor that can't go remote um, and the kinds of labor that um, that universities uh, treat as disposable, have treated for disposable for a, as disposable for a very long time, um, and are continuing um, to treat as disposable in, in wholly new ways um, at this present moment. Um, and I also think, you know, the the, the way in which, um, well, maybe I can save this comment for later. Um, yeah, uh, just pick, picking up on what, what Zach was saying about um, thinking of how service workers um, at universities have been left left out or ignored in um, administrators' uh, proclamations of, of how they'll be reopening in the fall. Um, like for, for example, that uh, op-ed in the New York Times by the president of Brown um, Paxson's op-ed. She talks about students and professors, but never never mentions um, service workers. Um, I, I think that that, that kind of um, administrative perspective um, has tended to uh, exhibit a, a logic of of crisis and and containment, um, where uh, with these these new um, uh, well, uh, way, ways of trying to contain the spread of the virus on campus with testing and um, contact tracing with these digital apps and, and with new forms of, of isolation and segregation for students on campus um, and, and more use of online teaching. But that, 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 that perspective um, treats, treats as uh, disposable the, the service workers on campus who who will um, still need to be there to do the, the work of maintenance and um, custodial work and food service um, and so yeah just just, just thinking about from, from an abolitionist perspective um, what 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 is a kind of al alternative imaginary um, for, for how we can understand the university in this time of the pandemic and the um, maybe post-pandemic period. Um, if we, we think of this, this dominant perspective as, as a kind of logic of containment and crisis and um, individualized self-responsibility and disposability, um, what, what, what would an abolitionist alternative imaginary look like? Um, and, and I think from that perspective, um, we can try to understand our, our organizing as um, uh, aspirationally uh, picking up the, the tradition of abolitionist organizing, um, particularly the left abolitionist perspective. We can al also think of right right wing forms of abolitionism, um, like the the pro life movement is also taking up that abolitionist banner. But 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 situating our, our organizing as a kind of left abolitionism, we can. Uh, see our, our organizing at universities as uh, aligned with and in collaboration with police and prison abolitionist movements um, and other forms of, of radical left abolitionist movements, feminist abolitionist movements. Um, and, and, and from those perspectives, we can um, pick up the, the principles that, that have guided those left abolitionist movements um, like like a um, ethos of, of solidarity and collective care uh, that, that we're seeing uh, exhibited now in the kinds of um, mutual aid organizing that's happening all, all over the country. Um, I, I assume it's happening there in, at, at your UC campuses and around your campuses as well. Um, and so, yeah, so for, from an abolitionist university studies kind of perspective, if, if we see the, the, the university as um, uh, a kind of uh, response to um, the, the loss of uh, accumulative power um, by the capitalist class um, 
after the Civil War, uh, seeing see universities as, as a kind of new new means of accumulation for for capital. Um, then we can think of of, of our organizing um, as kind of picking up the um, unfinished project of the abolitionist movement in in seeking to dismantle um, those uh, racial capitalist institutions um, that con continued on post-slavery. Thank you. Thank you all for, for situating us in the present. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to open it up to um, folks from Strike You and Cola. Um, if you could maybe uh, bring us up to speed a little on what's happening, Katie. Um, uh, Katie, Courtney, I think Matt is here. Um, uh, Tori, uh, if y'all want to speak and just uh, talk about why we kind of call this um, call this forum. Um, and what we hope to get out of it. Thank you, Anuj. Everybody, welcome. It's such a pleasure to have you. I um, have been reading the invitation that y'all wrote for a couple weeks and months now, just kind of reflecting on really the invitational mode that you've invited us to think politics with. And, and, it, and it strikes me as really important that we're having this conversation today. Um, and that at least this meeting is one of the largest gatherings we've had so far at Davis for COLA. And part of it has to do with a really complicated political moment that we're in right now that you all have spoken about with great um, wisdom. And I'm wondering if you could share more with us because we're trying to hold a strike and there are some very real antagonisms at play in particular between, as you've already talked about, the service workers and others that are often lauded as the, as the, uh, the people to be doing this work. Um, but then there are other antagonisms, right? It's between undergrads and grads, between grads and faculty. Really, real class distinctions that start to come up, especially when we're talking about strike politics. And, and I'm wondering if you could give us some wisdom about how to build, I don't even know if solidarity is the right word. I don't know if the invitational mode is what we should be thinking with. But I'm really interested in questions of durability, um, especially with regards to what abolition is, um, is, is offering in the moment. And can, would, can, there are a couple solid campaigns coming out of COLA that we'd also love your, your wisdom um, about. But that's for other people, I think. Thank you. Katie and Courtney, I'm unmuted both of you. Yeah, do we do you prefer we all say the questions first and then answer them, or do you want to do question answer, question answer? I'll do the questions first. Okay. Um, Courtney, I can go if that's okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, um, thank you so much to all the folks at Davis who put this together and to everyone who showed up um, to speak. Um, I'm, my name is Katie, I'm a first year physics student at Berkeley. And my question, I will preface by saying that I feel a lot of times I come into co organizing spaces and hear two different approaches and one is like, administration just needs to move some numbers around on a spreadsheet and we'll get paid more and we can pay our rent and pay for healthcare. And that's going to be the win. Um, and that's one angle. The other angle I think is captured by um, a part of the invitation that I'm just going to quote because I don't think I can rephrase it in a more eloquent way, which is that um, these, the kind of labor struggles that COLA is, uh, quote, might be understood through an abolitionist lens where we see them as struggles against the university's accumulative function that simultaneously contribute to struggles for building world-making projects alternative to racial colonial capitalism. Um, 
and I'm trying, I'm personally trying to situate myself more in the latter uh, frame of mind, but I also think that requires a lot deeper uh, political education and is maybe not quite as um, a tangible thing that you can draw people to, to rallies um, around or just like have a catchy headline about. So I'm in short wondering like, how do you see the role of political education in this? And like, how do we make sure that um, the abolitionist lens is, is still centered and prominent, um, even though it's more complex? Thanks. Hey, yeah, thank you both Katie and Tori for the points you raised. And um, just to echo other folks, um, thank you all, um, Nick, Abby, Zach. Um, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you already for all of the wisdom shared, um, but thank you for joining us today. And thank you to the UC Davis folks who were key in putting this together. But um, I think that Tori and Katie have already raised some great points. Um, so I won't say much other than, um, um, yeah, I would be interested in hearing more about um, mutual aid um, through the abolitionist lens. Um, I think someone had briefly touched on that. Um, and I'll just keep it at that. Thanks, Courtney. Matt, um, let me see if I can unmute you. Oh. Did you want to say uh, something, Matt? No, no. I'm uh, just. A, I'm, I'm Matt from UC Santa Barbara, uh, graduate student in religious studies. Um, no, I don't. I don't have anything to add. I think these are great questions. Um, and a, and, a, and a good frame for, for a discussion. Um, yeah, it's wonderful that radical action brings us together, but how do we keep this, keep this going? Um, now, especially in light of everyone ending their strike. Um, so yeah, I think the question of political education is key. Um, yeah. Thank you. I, I guess I did wanna add one question from my own end, which, or a couple of questions actually. Uh, one which was, um, we're talking about labor organizing within the university's graduate students, but also want to think about, I mean, and all, many of you already raised this issue, uh, just about what the future is, especially as so many uh, universities go into austerity measures and the furloughs. I'm just going to share this document um, on chat, which is something that Karen Kelsey, who runs this website called The Professor is in, she uh, helps graduate students um, apply for jobs, um, university jobs, and so she puts this together, and she's been a vocal critic of, of, the, of the PhD industry, in a sense, right? Um, and so for me, re looking at this, I'm really wondering, like, how are we organizing for the present moment as, under, as graduate students, uh, as a labor force, but then also for, like, what are we organizing for, for our futures? Like, what is this actually leading to? What are we being prepared to enter? Um, and so just sharing this document, which, and if you scroll to the end of it, uh, you'll see just uh, all the universities that are going into furlough, all the different ways in which uh, it's a really great resource. So one is I'm thinking about that. And the other thing I'm thinking about also is uh, something you all mentioned in the invitation, which is how do we actually think about the, the abolitionist framework to think beyond the university and to make those solidarity beyond the university because um, grad student labor and university labor is one part of a larger systemic uh, issue. Um, and then I guess I have a third thing too, which I want to throw in the mix, which is really thinking about, um, a lot of my work really deals with the non-human. Um, and um, how can we actually extend this the, the notion of the carceral and abolitionism to also think about um, how non-humans, how animals, animal testing, and how that, the whole regime of uh, carcerality kind of extends to the non-human, and how do we bring that into the conversation as well? So that's a I lot just, for y'all to chew on. I know, yeah. I know, and not, to, and not to add more, but I just want to piggyback really quickly off Anoush to say um, uh, an, another uh, um, 
thing that I'm really interested in, in hearing about um, um, and that Anuj alluded to is sort of um, the moment that we're in has really exposed our, and is continuing to um, further expose um, capitalism sort of for the, the sham that it is. And it's really providing organizers and community and um, an opportunity um, yeah, I, I think it's opportunities um, because to to recognize and um, how inextricably linked our struggles are and sort of how do we capitalize on that to um, build the revolution, right? Um, I feel like if we were ever to have that revolution, like it is now, um, there are so many strikes happening um, across across um, the nation and then also across the globe and, and how do we, um, yeah, capitalize on that to, to dismantle, the, dismantle the system essentially. And in that obviously um, addressing the issues we're experiencing um, around cost of living and the university and et cetera. We also have a question from Kieran in the chat. Can I can I just read that? Yes, please. Um, as graduate students seek to engage with abolitionist practices and analysis within there or are organizing both within and outside of COLA, how do we ensure that abolition retains its critique of anti-lock racial ordering and capital rather than being subsumed into a politic focused on democratizing the university? And I'm guessing that Kieran means anti-black. <laughs> yeah, he also followed up with the second question. <laughs> okay. But uh, abolitionist in name politics, um, uh, projects that, that are abolitionist in name but retain investments in institutions and systems that perpetuate racialized, and I assume racialized again, not radicalized, yes, racialized, uh, and class violence. Um, this is, I think, a question we came to a lot in thinking about the invitation and the project as we were developing it, which is like, what is the university that we want to think about in an abolitionist sense that is not merely destructive, but that is also generative, um, which is, you know, what is it about the university that we think is worth holding on to in a space that is otherwise, or in a politic or an organization of, of the social that is um, not, that is not kind of uh, wholly formed through settler colonial and kind of racial capitalist logics. And I think that's the question we, we, we didn't have, a, we don't have an answer to that. Um, so much as we wanted to kind of literally bring people into it. I mean, it was an invitation as a rhetorical form, right? So kind of, uh, I think Tori was addressing to kind of draw people in, but it was also genuinely trying to open up a conversation about, you know, what is it about universities or something like a university, like a strike university, for instance, that we, we might want to imagine collectively and, and foment and kind of be part of. Um, because, you know, universities are unique, unique yeah. in addition to being kind of these accumulative kind of spaces of capital in the state, there are also unique concentrations of resources that are used towards different kinds of ends. Um, there's something that brought us all to them um, that, you know, I think the question is, what, what do we want to imagine as a university otherwise or the university that could come? Um, and I think that's something we have to think about collectively. So I'd be curious to know kind of what's bringing you all here too, right? Like kind of why are we all in the space together? Which also gets to the question of durability and sustainability, which is, I think, one of relationality and kind of how we are with each other and who we are to each other, how we show up. Um, so being here is, is part of that. I don't know if any of the other AUS folks want to come in. Um, I'd also love to hear, again, more from people on the ground um, about kind of what's informing these questions and um, yeah, what we can do for you. I would just, I mean, I'd, I'd say also it would be good to know a little bit more of the, the, the substance about what the antagonistic class your relations that you're, you're seeing emerge between undergrads and grad students, grad students and faculty. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, I, I have some context from the perspective of being faculty now at UC Santa Cruz about some of what, what that can look like, but I don't want to want to assume that 
that moves uh, that moves seamlessly from campus to campus or context to context, and also, you know, as faculty, it look it can look a certain way um, that is not necessarily how it looks for other folks. Um, I think that one of the one of the things, but like it, first of all, I think one of the useful frames of this kind of moment and the strike moment is is that it can shed some light on those relations as class relations um and i think it's it's difficult in pr particular because the um grad student faculty relation is so shot through with the with an injunction to identify as uh like identify with the faculty position that the distance between how you are located vis-a-vis -vis the institution um oftentimes gets muted as uh like at like as an actual class um relationship and i think it it also helps when thinking about that relation to, to understand that generation and different di different structural contexts mediate that kind of um, relationship in deep and not very well explored ways and that faculty are so poorly trained in being able to understand those relations <laughs> that they have no analytical vocabulary um almost like give, like almost across the board they have next to no analytic vocabulary to make sense of their own their own class position within the university as a class position um and they it's in many ways in their interests not to have that 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 kind of analytic and so when you wonder how why faculty are responding in some kinds of ways um when you see certain kind of consistencies in, in this kind of um benevolent paternalism that that is oftentimes the default response to faculty who even are, are the closest things that you can imagine as allies um, those are those are pre-scripted responses of a certain kind of class formation um, situated in in the university, but also the like with regard to the, the the relation between undergrads and grads. One of the things I think it's useful to kind of to consider is just if the university is an institution within a certain with a certain relation to capitalist mode of production one of the things that the university produces is students and one of the things i think that we tried to do in the, in the invitation is denaturalize that category of students in an important way but like i think that denaturalization also can be useful to differentiate the, the, the ways in which it positions different formations of students vis-a-vis -vis, um, each other. Um, and I think that especially when we're thinking about uh, the way that grad students are located with in COLA, the, in, the institutional investment in producing grad students as students for certain ends and grad students as workers for other ends, workers who are part-time so that they don't have the same kind of, uh, th th that such that the, the other part of the work that they do unwaged as students goes unrecognized but not only just unrecognized uh the fee waiver that that, that your work as tas ostensibly covers also gets used and redeployed in the discourse of studenthood as if your work as student is covered as a gift from the state and so the, the 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 simultaneous production of a contradiction between worker and student has a really particular structural function in the context of the of the grad student uh like your tuition waiver never comes to you as cash right you couldn't withhold it for example from like you know tuition for the university but it's there both as recognition recognition of your status as student but also kind of to function as 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 a representation of a gift given to you so that it's not taxed etc cetera, etc cetera, um, of, of your student status whereas that is positioned a lot differently than students who are imagined as consumers um, undergrad students who are imagined as consumers and so like differentiations between the category of the student especially because like in order to be a student consumer some students also become debtors <laughs> and the, the, the way that that actually 
creates divergent class interests between different positions ostensibly that inhabit the same category. I think being able to kind of tease out the, those, those differences in the way they get, they get produced systemically is a, a useful way of kind of parsing why different formations um, inhabit uh, moments in different ways. Oh, um, I could I could say a little um, response to the question about mutual aid from an ab abolitionist lens, and particularly in relation to universities. Um, and, and maybe this also touches on the question about how to sustain relationships of of solidarity um, in in more durable way durable ways over time. Um, just, just just thinking about. Um, the kind of mutual aid organizing that's been happening all over lately. Um, so, so um, when when disasters like like this pandemic happen, um, many many more people feel increased vulnerability to harm and and then feel more receptive to mutual aid, which is why so many people are getting involved now. But 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 before these these um, seemingly sudden disasters happen, many many people have already been practicing forms of mutual aid in order to survive under the ongoing disasters of, of racial capitalism. Um, that, that, that status quo, the settler colonial racial capital status quo um, makes people uh, particularly, particularly along lines of race and class immigration status disproportionately vulnerable to harm and premature death. Um, so, so there, there has been mutual aid organizing happening all over all the time, um, especially in working class, black, indigenous, Latinx communities. Um, so, so I think that's that's a really important starting point for thinking about mutual aid from an abolitionist lens. Um, but then now during these um, seemingly sudden disasters like the, the pandemic, um, those inequalities and violences, uh, the normal ones are, are intensified as um, people who are more marginalized or made, made even more vulnerable. Um, and, and so um, mutual aid organizing from an abolitionist lens need, needs to um, try to um, uh, grapple with those, those inequalities and, and to um, actively uh, try to build relationships across segregations um, within cities, within neighborhoods, across neighborhoods, and, and ac across the divides of campuses from the surrounding communities. Um, so, so I think um, for, for people engaging mutual aid organizing now in and around universities, I think taking an abolitionist uh, transformative justice lens in that organizing can be um, particularly generative for, for organizing right now. Um, trying to get, to get people in universities and surrounding communities to think about the ways that universities have accumulated their wealth through racial capitalist um, uh, relations of exploitation, um, exploiting the labor of people in surrounding communities over many, many years. And, um, and, and then on the basis of that, that kind of reckoning to, to think of how um, through mutual aid, solidarity, organizing that that, that kind of um, uh, uh, injustice, historical and ongoing injustice could be um, un undone um, both, both through direct redistribution of resources, um, but, but also through transforming dismantling the, the institutions that have um, created those those inequalities um, including universities and and the, the k-12 through school system um, so I think that's that's a big kind of challenge for any mutual aid organizing going on and and, and then, then also to think about from, from our kind of abolitionist university studies perspective to th think of how the kind of studying that we're doing 
in in this in and through this mutual aid organizing is is constituting a kind of alternative university in itself or studying together collectively not not through individualized commodified forms of studying that we're used to in educate in the education system but instead um, collective um, directly democratic kinds of um, studying practices that that are that are um, uh, entwined with our, our organizing and, and relationship building practices. So you think of that as a kind of abolition university um, being prefigured in some ways, maybe. I, I guess I can, I can jump in. I wanted to respond to, I think it was Katie's question about the distinction between the kind of like, um, the, the conversation between uh, around um, you know uh, juggling money around um, a, as a way of kind of solving and winning a strike, um, and on the other hand, the kind of um, uh, sense of of the labor struggle as as something that that is more capacious and that directly challenges um, the way that the university accumulates. Um, and I think that like for for me speaking less in terms of of cola. Um, then, uh, in terms of my own experience as having been on strike at, uh, at universities, um, both as an undergraduate and, and as a graduate student, um, what I found profoundly radical still about the strike as a form of, of struggle, right, is that there's always kind of the potential for that, the former to, to shift into the um, the latter, right? For, for it to kind of spawn that kind of like much more capacious, radical imaginary um, in, in, in the folks who are participating in it. Um, that sense that um, the horizon of struggle could be um, constantly expanding outward um, and uh, developing an increasingly radical understanding of what was at stake, um, of how to achieve it. And it out of what the possibilities were for building something new um, out of the ashes of the old, if you'll forgive me quoting Ralph Chaplin for a second. Um, and, and so I, I think that um, what, what one can do in, in a context like this, right, is to, to encourage that, um, that project, um, to, uh, to encourage that kind of thinking about the, the radicalism of the COLA struggle um, the radicalism of the strikes that we've seen developing across um, the country, not just in the UC system, but um, uh, but across the, the country in response to uh, the coronavirus. Um, and not just labor strikes, but rent strikes um, and other forms of, of the withholding of, of labor and, and um, uh, in, in a variety of different contexts. Um, one argument that I, I, you know, did not generate but find persuasive, right, is that in some ways, this move to stay at home might be thought of as itself, you know, a, a kind of de facto general strike. And then, then in that sense, we would also have to see the, the rallies to get people back to work um, as a particularly vicious and venal form of strike breaking, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then I also, um, was thinking about you know the, the question of how to sustain radical action when when the strike is over. Um, I don't know if this is a particularly um, you know abolitionist or abolitionist university studies response to that question, but um, but that's a, a kind of very um, uh, pregnant question um, for me, um, having. Um, sort of had to negotiate that question during my own kind of work as an organizer after the NYU strike, which lasted for seven months and then suddenly wasn't happening anymore. And, and there was a real question as to, okay, well, what do we do now? Um, and, it, you know, we, we did a, a number of things. We took over the, um, the student government like structure that they had created as a company union to replace the union um, and spent like, uh, about a year and a half uh, pretending to negotiate with them, um, something that, that Rana can um, tell anybody who wants more details on that about because she was one of the people in the little room with the administrators. Um, 
pretending to negotiate with them. Uh, but but also, right, um, uh, we had to um, think about, you know, how do you organize after um, after a defeat and how do you kind of rebuild a, a, the potential for, for um, any kind of like radical struggle in the wake of people getting fired, uh, people being threatened with deportation. Um, and there, there isn't a pat and easy answer for that. These are extraordinarily difficult questions. Um, and I, I think that like part of the answer is that you, you keep talking, right? Um, not necessarily you, you keep meeting because, you know, advocating for more meetings sounds like an insane thing to do. Excuse me, that's ableist. Um, sounds like a, a ridiculous thing to do. Um, but, um, uh, but I, I do think that like being kind of in communication with each other um, and working to kind of sustain those, those projects of, of collective struggle. Um, uh, th that's what, what carried us through um, that really weird and, and difficult um, and, and really disempowering moment. I'm wondering if based on, is it Fauzia, uh, uh, the question in the chat, if, if not just necessarily, but a kind of extending or seeing the end of a strike or the extension of a strike, but also the expansion of a strike. Um, we have a lot uh, of workers. I think Fazi is getting at the question of, of tenured faculty who are also uh, disenchanted, <laughs> to say the least, with the status of the university right now. So I don't know if you would want to speak at all to kind of what it means for, I'm, I'm tenured track, but I'm not currently tenured. And here we're doing some organizing around the kind of precarity of untenured faculty, which we've seen, I think is at Ohio already, um, with untenured faculty being um, released from their jobs, um, that there's some you know, fears for people in this particular portion of the employment space. But um, what are the potentials for particularly tenured faculty to kind of be doing some of this lifting and to kind of be coming together based on the kind of what could happen as a result of this crisis, kind of opportunity moment for the university to consolidate um, what you've marked out here as a corporatization, but as, as um, certain practices that might not, again, align with what we would imagine or hope for the future of the university. Expanding beyond just, you know, graduate students and other workers. I just wanted to also flag that Gabby had a comment, um, which was responding to specifically what you and Nick were asking about, like, specific relations uh, at UC, and maybe I can read that out. Or Gabby, would you want to say it in your own words? And then Marcelo also is on stack, and then maybe we can get in that order then to Fauzi as well, who can respond to your question then. So I'll, I'll start with Marcelo because he was on stack first and then go to Gabby's question and then come back to Fauzi. Uh, okay. Hi, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Marcelo. I'm um, finishing the PhD in Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley. Uh, we've been participating in the movement from our campus. Um, and I just wanted to share some um, reflections that hopefully is helpful to this um, general conversation. So just gratitude for the organizers and for the folks who are like having this particular like space. Um, but there's just some things I wanted to share um, that I, uh, how this like how it took shape for uh, UC Berkeley, which is in Huchin, in the occupied Ohlone Lishan territory here in, in Berkeley. Um, the like w one thing that some of the tangible ways that I feel uh, that came up for us within uh, the organizing was uh, a difficulty of like being able to have a shared like lineage and understanding and of, of the situation of like where where are we coming at into this thing that's called cola which for uh a lot of the indigenous black and, and poc graduate students that came in we're doing other work and we have an idea of like another relationship to this kind of work and then cola for me oh, it, oh the word that i that's come out of the collective that we're a part of has always been that it's been like a kind of like a liberal concession like it's been like a, a demand uh, of like pay us more 
is something that um, for, like we, we have tried to get behind and try to work in solidarity, but the pay us more has, isn't, isn't enough of a demand within the context of like what ended up happening especially if it's not tied to what I think is the more radical part of COLA, which is like not only pay us more, but are others willing to be paid less? Or are we willing to demand and call out the, the, the way in which the corporatization and privatization of the university has created this um, neoliberal situation where we have administrators functioning as like uh, as, as, as corporate executives? Um, and so then that's just within COLA. But like more broadly, I'm just thinking of like um, the fact that for me, I, I would, uh, I really hope that in an abolition conversation, that part of it, of the visioning of abolition is then situating ourselves in that lineage of abolition as a project, uh, I feel like really helps address a lot of these problems in the sense that COLA um, does, its lineage is, is mainly to my, please correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but this for me, it's it is in a more of a, a student labor lineage, and that is distinct, but in solidarity and parallel to an abolitionist project, which for me, uh, there's really tangible of being able to hold the UC in particular to account. We're talking about UC uh, to uh, slavery, to chattel slavery, to settler colonialism, to genocide to uh, its ties with the prison industrial complex, with the military industrial complex. I think those are all things that we can really concretely organize together to do that. Uh, and I feel like that for me, um, uh, doesn't, uh, how do you, that, that just, it, it, there's so much work that's already been done that we can just find a way for it to make sense for where we're at as graduate students and all the, ways in which we've been asked to, uh, we've been undermined, I think, are, are all those, the, the, the I, in the end, my reflection is that the pay us more as a demand and COLA has been really um, in it, has had its own um, limits that then it was really easy to pit us against undergrads, faculty, all the, uh, against other workers that are um, custodial workers. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, I'm sorry if that was uh, not as articulate as I'd like it to be, but I just feel like something like abolition or decolonization or other traditions that give us something to, to plug into as opposed to COLA, uh, or not as opposed to, in relation to COLA, but that COLA might not need to be the center. That's what I'm trying to say. That if COLA is our center, it's just kind of a shaky base um, because it doesn't have the deep roots that something like abolition does. And um, the last thing I'll just really mention is that I really think we need to look to global uh, struggles of uh, Rose Must Fall, of our own Third World Liberation Front, of, of like just to expand in terms of geographically uh, the student movements in Chile, student movement, like radical student movements throughout the world, um, I think need to be something that we're really paying serious attention to and in dialogue with um, because they're, they're not asking just for COLA, they're asking for free education, they're asking for a complete dismantling of a colonial institution. So, okay, thanks for giving me my time. Sorry if I spoke a lot, thanks. I guess since Gabby has taken herself off back. I think, um, she, I think Gabby can go, actually. Gabby, do you wanna share what you were thinking? One second, Gabby. I'm just gonna find you on the list. Uh, where are you? Oh, there. Hi. So most of what I said, actually, Marcelo already said it way, way, way better. So I guess one one thing to note is that there is another like moderate or even I might actually say conservative tendency that even is coming up for instance in the grad student workers union that is trying to end a COLA not because they actually want to pivot to a larger uh, reparations project um, that uh, Marcelo just really wonderfully put out 
but because they're kind of mobilizing like liberal multicultural ideas of privilege being like grad students are privileged we shouldn't be fighting like they started calling cola a raise instead of what it is which is a cost of living adjustment and that like grad students as like a very privileged class or undergrads as a very privileged class shouldn't be fighting because black and brown workers at the uc need more than us without for instance acknowledging that like going on strike alongside unions like ask me 3299 which we legally can't do lifts up their demand so i guess i i am concerned the way that that has been watered down and would love to think about how something like marcella articulated can combat those like centrist liberal sentiments that we're starting to see spread to shut down the cola particularly as we're going into the summer break thanks Um, I don't know if y'all want to respond or if we should move to Fauzia because Abby, you had had a specific mm -hmm. uh, question for Fauzia. Should we? I also think Nick wanted to come in on something. Okay. Yes, and Nick had wanted to raise Kieran's question as well. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to respond to Kieran's question about um, how to, the question I think was how to ensure that abolition, uh, that the abolition retains um, its relation to a critique of, of anti-black racism, um, and I, I think I like. I, I, I think I have to start with just a little bit of an annoying answer. Uh, hopefully, that, like I can get get to why like I, I want to start there, um, which is just that I don't think that there is a way of ensuring. Um, I think that when you, when you build political frameworks, you you make when you build ideas, when you build political frameworks, when you organize, you create ideas, you craft ideas with others in a way that they can live in people's mouths that are not your own, um, and that means that people are going to do things with those ideas that you, that do not carry your intentions with them. Um, and so, like, it, so, so that other people carrying them up, like, can all, both be seen reflective of success, and it can also be a grounds for complete failure or reversal of of the intentions that you wanted to carry the, 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 those very ideas. And so, trying to keep keep uh, the I, the idea of abolition uh, attached to the politics, I don't think there's a way of ensuring it. Because, just because I think that the struggle is the way of fighting to keep it attached and ra rather than um, I don't think that th th there's, there's a way that, that keeps them attached. And I think that in many ways, I would, I don't know if it's the critique of anti-Black racism <laughs> that, that, that I want to retain as much as I, the capacity to fight anti-Black racism. Partly because I, th I think the critique of anti-Black racism has in many ways, uh, in, in, in some of its academic institutionalization, uh, become pretty um, severed from some efforts to fight anti-Black racism and um, in such a way that holds critique as the end in itself. Um, and I think one of the, the ideas that we tried to kind of, um, we tried to tinker around with at the end of the invitation was just this idea that um, may, maybe, Critique is a tool. <laughs> maybe it's 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 means, but maybe it's also something that 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 can do. Um, it, it, that we wanted to kind of tease out the difference between critique and transformation, <laughs> the differences between critique and organizing. Part of because of the way that critique has been enshrined as a value upheld by the university, and it's not that it can't do important work for engaging in kinds of struggles, but I just wouldn't want to hold, I, I wanted to make sure that it doesn't hold the imagine of the imagination of the end in itself. So I think the, the, now the question, if the question is how, how can we try and keep abolition attached to doing the work of, of, of fighting anti-black racism, I think that's, that, that, that's an important and, and, and generative question. Part, part of it has to be uh, about being able to tell those histories, and I think it's especially important to be able to make, to connect the dots institutionally between the history of the UC, not only with, with its relationship to um, 
to the rise of the pr pr prison industrial complex, but also to its, its relationship to various forms of, of enslavement. I mean, I think that we, we start to kind of talk about in the, in the invitation, the, the fact that um, the reason we call the post-slavery university as, as a constitutive moment is largely because the university gets offered as promising to retain all of the productivity of slavery without the ethical crisis of slavery. And so this is why you see the Moral Land Grant Act get, get formulated in 1862. This is why you see institutions like MIT come into being in 1862, because th there's this idea that at least land, land grants can do the work through settler colonialism uh, and, and the productivity that, that science, science can add to labor, uh, allowing the same kind of productivity without having to worry about the ethical crisis and the political crisis of of incarceration. And so um, I, th I think that like being being able to first and foremost tell those histories, but also tell about the, the ways in which the departure uh, from the idea of, of universal higher e education in Cal California, um, largely the, the instrument for doing it was systematized forms of, of, of anti-Black racism. It's not some neutral imagination of austerity. Um, austerity itself gets carried by ideological and institutional functions of reproducing, um, reproducing forms of, of anti-Black racism by other means. And so um, when we talk about, like, I think that moving the critique away from just neutral terms like privatization and in with an understanding that the, the vehicle of privatization is itself uh, it gives flesh to various forms of anti-Black racism and it's animated by those very forms, I think can really help us to kind of retell the story about some of these terms that kind of um, get, get mobilized as if they're neutral. Fazia, if you wanted to respond, uh or to the question. I don't think she wants to. <laughs> I'm wondering if it might be useful, um, given Marcelo's point and Gabby's point, to think more about the kind of limits and necessities of something like COLA. Um, like what was the, the goal of the COLA campaign? I guess I, I always understood it from afar from from out in, uh, Connecticut um, as kind of a stage in a process of demands but one that recognized that COLA itself would never be sufficient but actually there needs to be a remaking of like the rental uh, economy in in the areas of in Davis for instance which I'm familiar with or in, in Santa Cruz that it was um, yeah I'm sorry I guess I'm wondering if there's something about an imagination that is larger than just the COLA that was present in the, the movements um, and, and the different organizing on different campuses, or if that wasn't a conversation that was kind of already there. I think it totally, sorry, Abby, thank you for your question. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I introduced myself properly before, I'm Tori. I'm a seventh year in the anthropology department, so I've been around for too many years of these cycles of police repression, police repression. But it's, I think what's really interesting about this this current move is, is that it, in many ways, like occupied for it, it does gather together a diversity of people to have the conversations about different stages towards liberation. And like, there is a almost a, too much of a diversity of tactics around such that like, I think the largest problem that we have, which is why I asked my first question is collectivity, right? This question, like actually figuring out how to get beyond the individualism or beyond the identitary, identitarianism. I can never say this word, the turning into identity of personhood. That financial capitalism does, especially in the UC. Um, but I, I, I actually think one way into this question, and I want to take the opportunity to, to name and recognize one of our brilliant mentors and scholars and professors, Dr. Olivia Cuevas, whose work in abolition in UC Davis has just been founded for many of us. And she has this assignment, and I'm just going to post it here because it's it's worth the the, the point in which she asks is to reimagine a jail budget and rebuild the jail from their imaginations up with a question of safety and, and, and desire in mind. 
And I think for, for me, as I've been trying to grapple with this question of class, con class consciousness and trans class solidarity, the budget really becomes a central organizing practice. And especially if we can reclaim a kind of, or teach students to, and teach ourselves to reclaim a sense of almost, uh, well, I don't know, maybe Dr. Carlos can share about the power of this assignment in her classes. Are you here? With, are you willing to share your work with us? I'm looking. Uh, yeah. I'll mute myself. Okay, can you hear me now? Welcome, yes, we can hear you. Hi. Oh, I'll even put my video on so I don't have to hide. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, um, what can I say about the assignment? Um, you know, I, I landed at Davis three years ago, um, leaving Southern, you know, I'd been in Southern California for so long, I'd been involved in critical resistance since probably the get-go. Um, and it was really, you know, geography, the differences between Southern California and Central and Northern California are so drastic. Um, but how, how do I say this? Um, the assignment, I came up with this assignment. So I didn't really know how to kind of get connected and start doing my work on the ground um, with formerly incarcerated and system impacted students, as well as faculty and staff. I mean, I'm always, I mean, some of my organizing on campus is finding folks like me, either you've been in jail or your immediate family's been in jail, right? Which also kind of creates a certain kind of, I mean, we were talking about class differences and class solidarities. You know, there's very big differences in class, like class even between professors, huge ones. Well, and there's not a lot of us who are system impacted or have been in prison ourselves. So, you know, doing that work on campus um, and trying to pull all these folks together, you know, was when the students were kind of saying, but what can we really do? You know, what, what are we gonna do about you know, our own families being in and out of prison. And, um, you know, the assignment that I came up with, which is called, I think it's called something, uh, reimagining the state or reimagining prisons and, or AKA get your money back. Like literally that's what I call it. It's like, get your money back project. It's all about get your money back. And I tell them, um, and I explain to them, like to understand if what we're talking about is money in different forms. Um, how it moves through the state, how it lands, I guess, in our lives. You know, some of us, again, who are system impacted or have been in prison ourselves, we're on campus um, as students, and some of us even as faculty, um, we're at the UC and our family is in CDC, right? And they're parallel. And especially if you've been in the UC system since around the 1990s, like we lived through watching that particular type of that money and the spending on prisons, um, come to its kind of fruition, right? And so I had a speaker come into my class about six years ago, um, who was also an abolitionist, did some um, work in the Bay Area. And he had this, uh, he had this exercise and, and I used it ever since. And he asked folks, well, what makes you feel safe and secure, right? And I, my classes are huge. I have classes that are 100, 150 students. Um, and I would make this, and he made a big list every time they would say something. And I do the same thing in every time I teach my prisons course, not my police course, although I think I might try to do this for, for cops too. But, um, you know, and everything goes up, like, obviously, safe place to sleep, my own bedroom, a telephone, my books, food, a park. I mean, every, uh, my music. I mean, there's all these things that make them feel um, that they have, that they're safe and secure. I call home and I know everybody's okay. Never is there jails in prison, ever. And I ask, I don't try to, I don't try to kind of push that. I just, I have them kind of meditate on what makes you feel secure. Never is it prisons or police. So what Simon is really taking that, that, it, you know, it ends up being this big humongous blackboard filled with all these different things. My pets, you know, my friends, um, going dancing, clean water. Um, and I'm like, okay, all those things build me now go find a prison, locate one of the prisons in California. Uh, first part of the research project is find how much it costs to build from the inception, even if it's San Quentin, right? San Quentin being the oldest prison in California. Um, how much it costs to build, what kind, of, what kind of labor did it take to build it? And then presently, what's the budget and how much is spent on um, housing an inmate per, per year, right? And I kind of equate them with being 
you know, also individuals who do or don't get money from the state in that same kind of way, right? So, um, and so they, and, and I tell them, just use your imagination, whatever you want to build me, you could build me, you know, I've had students turn Pelican Bay uh, into an arts academy uh, with people living on it. Um, I've had students turn Folsom Prison into like a hydroponics community grow food place where people live and they actually, and I, you know, now I've been kind of incorporating other professors that do like design and architect. Some of these students like take the river because I asked them to use the whole geography, use the physical geography. So they take the American river and they, this is how they uh, uh, water the gardens at Folsom prison, which, you know, has a different name. Um, it turned San Quentin into amusement, public amusement park research center for marine life. I mean, all, all across the board, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, but the most important thing I think that the students get out of it is when they see the amount of money that is spent on prisons, like some of them cost more than others, like anything with a shoe, like Pelican Bay's um, budget is, you know, $2.3 billion a year. Some of the other state prisons, not so much. It's more like in the maybe under a hundred million dollars, which is still a ton of cash, right? What these students end up finding out as I tell them, now when you build me this new, whatever it is, like unicorn farm, if you want, um, you have to pay workers, there has to be transportation, like build, do all of it, build the whole thing. And what they can't believe, and I think this is where I feel the most movement happening with the students to kind of get them engaged and to fight against um, how much money is spent on prisons versus the UC system, right? Because that's what I can attach it to closest, is they start realizing a billion dollars is almost unspendable, right? Like all of a sudden they gotta pay workers and they're like, well, I got 10,000 workers and I'm already paying them $25 an hour and, I'm paying it, and they still can't spend the money. Like the money is almost unspendable and, and it blows their mind. They're like, oh my God, how, do, how does this happen? When there's billions over here and I have to pay, you know, registration fees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, the whole idea is like, what would it look like to even transform the UC in that way, right? With this particular type of money, if we spend $70,000 a year per prisoner, what could you do that? How would you live with $70,000 in your pocket if that's what the state gave you? And they really just, they get, I mean, it it, they, they become kind of like, uh, they kind of like live it in this other type of way when I make them understand what the money is about and how do you get your money back? My next step is gonna be, how do we go get that money? I don't know, I, that one, I, you know, uh, like, I mean, like, how do we go fight for it? Like, get it, get it, like really get it, um, all of it. Um, that's my next step. But it to understand the money, I think it's really important right, to make that real, to make the numbers real to them, to indict and be in an indictment against the UC. I think, you know, when student find, students find out things like how the UC, UCOP had invested in private prisons for what, like 11 years, nobody kind of knew, and then they finally got called out on it and they had to kind of do that retraction, but then they didn't go and reinvest the money. Like I had a class of students that started trying to find out how much money they profited off of it. We couldn't find it. We spent a year and a half. They couldn't, we couldn't get access to the profit off of that. Um, so we kind of came up with it in our imagination again, how much money they might have made. And, you know, for a year I had these seminars where the students, where they were trying to develop, how are we going to go ask for that amount back? Like go to the steps of the UC Regents and say, we want this back for system impacted and formerly incarcerated people. Um, and again, it was kind of trying to identify the money and indict the university. I mean, that's as real as I could make it, you know, like as tangible as I could make it, so. Abby, I, I know I unmuted you because uh, maybe you want to respond, but um, if Fauzia is still here, she had actually wanted to speak directly to you. So maybe you can answer both of these together. Um, so maybe I don't see her here anymore. I think we've lost her. So, I guess I was just curious about what that similar kind of exercise would look like in thinking about the university it's, it, itself, actually, as, as the object to be abolished, right? Looking at university budgets in that kind of digging in way, just thinking about where do where do funds actually go, and what could we imagine this institution or place to be, repurposing all those funds. 
because there's also massive amounts of wealth, obviously, um, and resources within these institutions. So, you know, what would a similar project assignment, um, collective thinking exercise be to reimagine the UC, not not just the prison system, right? I think that could be a worthwhile endeavor. I'm wondering if we should go back to some of the questions that lingering questions that we had or if folks have other folks have comments or um, um, Zach, did you have a point that you wanted to make to Karen's question at some point or was that Nick? Uh, I think I think that was that was Nick. okay. What is in place? Like what's, what, are, what are you all planning as the quarter kind of gets going further and further? When you think about the summer, like are there ongoing interventions? Is there work to bring in a kind of tenured faculty into the organizing in different ways? Um, Cause I'm curious about what's going on. Each campus is in a really different place. Katie is at Berkeley and they're finishing the semester. So I think of they're course, in a yeah. different, like a different place. And then Irvine's strike is, very mutual aid, social welfare. Davis is struggling. I have a vision of a, of a democratized like worker co-op at UC Davis that's being visioned by Native American studies as practice. They would like to turn into a worker co-op. So actually take that budget question that Ophelia offered us and like, and like seize the means of discussion about it and just decide collectively where people should be working, where people should be studying together. But that we're a long way from that because the power of the strike is being um, deliberately weakened, I would say, by agitating forces as well as just generalized class divisions, um, which are made more powerful because of authoritarianism and fear. I'm wondering though, like what is the power of the strike right now where universities are so dependent on instructional faculty as the primary people interacting with students? Like, is there something different in particular about the organization of labor right now that actually is more beneficial to a strike, to a teaching strike, um, and where more more faculty are actually directly affected in ways that they might be more willing to participate in something like a strike. I think faculty are scared right now, right? Faculty are scared about what's happening with online education and what, what could come. That's what I'm seeing, at least in my institution, which is a very different kind of institution now than where y'all are at there's an overwhelm right there's a traumatic response that i think is making are making folks um uh really focus in on what what they understand to be possible so the habitual which makes imagination of the kind that you all are inviting us into really really difficult gabby has a point that everyone's overworking now but also with full pass policies so we could cancel all of our zoom sessions and be sick um and seemingly the university wouldn't care or know because they keep changing the same tuition and give everyone a pass anyway. So I think really what we're seeing is like the university is letting us basically do a general strike, but because of individual habituation, uh, it's difficult to. That's not gonna be sustainable into the fall, right? Students aren't gonna sign up, um, or at least the students who, who have the capacity not to sign up, not to come back, to go on leave simply aren't going to come and they're going to sue institutions if they do come back. Um, so that, that's not a sustainable tactic by the institution. I mean, so there's two competing, there's two separate questions happening in the group. Uh, yeah. One is from me to uh, one of the lecture organizers here called Erica about who's, who's just recently organized a digital picket for the lecturers union. So that might get at this question of solidarity differently because Rahaf's point is yeah, tenured faculty benefit from the structures of the university. So why as a movement do we need to focus on bringing in oppressors um, when that class dynamic really does become so strict and severe in departments? I mean, I, I, I can, I can, as an oppressor, I can talk about this a little bit. A little bit. Um, yeah, like, listen, like, you know, like, 
there are many faculty, like as a class faculty of the problem. Um, like not the problem, but like a real big part of the problem. I also think that, that there are ways of trying to bring them in because you don't like it, it, if it's if it's a structural problem and not just a moral problem, then there's something that people can do because tenured faculty have access to certain parts of the way the institution moves, it, the, the, way, the way that it uh, operates through resources, the way it governs, the way it gets governed, and the way it go yeah, like um, the operations of the university. So to the extent that you want that to be uh, part of the strategy and to the extent that that can be a way of intervening strategically in the university, um, having some sense of how you want to view uh, faculty who have some relation uh, to and ha have some protection within the overall um, operations of the university r really, you know, matter. I'll also say, like, you know, as as a faculty member with, with tenure now, like, oh my God, the shit that comes flying your way, like from every single direction and like, you know, handling 10 different student disciplinary cases and uh, trying to figure out how to, how to build solidistic or solidaristic relations and trying to not have my colleagues be full on counterinsurgents, it, it's, it, it's stressful. And like, you know, you, you, you get a sense why there's a lot, there's been a long history of black faculty dying young <laughs> in these institutions who have the protections of tenure, but who don't actually have the protections of tenure in, in actually existing fact. So like thinking about how, how you operate with it within those governance structures is, is one of the, the, the questions and how you, you, you organize um, within them. I think that, you know, one of the things that we learn in the context of the COLA strike, and I can talk also, I, I really appreciated Marcelo's co co comments earlier and the, 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 I thought they were so thoughtful about like how you, sit in discomfort about this framework without like just outright re re rejecting this framework because you see you see some of the possibility there. I think that's one of the, the real tensions that I've seen a lot of students of color have to inhabit and inhabit brilliantly in, in, in the, the past months. Um, but like one of the things that we found in the context of the COLA strike was that there was a lot of faculty who weren't showing up who sounded a lot different when we actually talked to them one on one. Um, and what, one of the things that we were actually in the, in the process of um, in, in the right before we had to, uh, we, we had to break for COVID before they, sh they shut the campus down was uh, a plan on one on one meetings with faculty because after an informal survey that we, we conducted, we realized that there, if you just if you just um, measured faculty engagement or interest by who showed up, who did and didn't show up at the picket line, um, you actually missed part of the story. There was a lot of faculty who were will who wanted some way of being solidaristic, but like also had a lot of counterinsurgent tendencies, and they were not about to show up at a picket line no matter what. Some of them just had kids. Some of them were busy. Some of them had full lives, and some of them just like you know like that that mode of activism wasn't for them. But what we found was there was a surprising number of faculty who had never shown up at the picket line at all who were willing to strike and th they were willing to strike in like strike uh against the dismissal um of of striking teaching assistants and uh we're talking about like we entire departments no one showed up the like two-thirds majority of the faculty were in favor of, of striking. So in some cases, figuring out how to phrase the action or the ask differently in such a way that it, it, it allows people to, you know, faculty don't, they, a lot of them just don't like to show up. <laughs> um, but they, you know, 
the faculty do see like a valid form of agency that consists in the act of refusal. It's the same part of us that fetishizes the hell out of critique. Like we, we, we like to say no, and we think that agency consists in the saying of no a lot more than we like to think, like take the risk of saying yes to anything. And that is a strategic block for actually building something. Those folks are, folks are not gonna show up for most parts of the struggle. But if they can do this one thing, that's something that you can build movements around. So like, I, I think thinking about people like as, you know, like frankly, instrumentally, um, not, not as people that you want to be as part, be part of your, your, your revolution in the long term, but people who like, you know, they're, they're, they're useful just because they can uh, blockade due to their institutional function is one way of imagining how to, how to relate to tenured faculty within this context. I'm wondering, as we get to like last 15 minutes of the session, um, if um, if we should really think about like next steps or stra like specific strategies. I know um, one of the folks who was um, has been instrumental in organizing Strike You, Melanie uh, Brazel, had a question which was specifically thinking about um, how we might um, like had questions about strategies for getting cops off campus and developing transformative justice models to replace them for student disciplinary stuff. So I don't know if there's like specific projects that we can try to gather through this forum. Uh, and I know one conversation is, is barely enough. And so hopefully this is the beginning of a series of conversations that we're gonna do. But I'm wondering if we can move into some kind of just next step visioning into the next, um, for the next 15 minutes or so as a way to wrap up this conversation and move into a a different phase. Can I be a shill for my own idea? <laughs> uh, I really think that the organizers of color need to like actually start leading strikes. And I think that the, the you know, not, I think that the, the tactics of the third world liberation front, like while great inspiration are probably not the tactics that, that are gonna be useful today. But because universities are so reliant on students of color for the recruitment of other students of color, um, the fact that students of color can like, op op like offer their own labor as recruitment instruments as something that they can refuse uh, and not only refuse, like refuse in a no, but a refuse in an active discouragement of other students of color to come to campus. This is something that can be a source of great decisive leverage and that can make universities move in ways that I think that we don't quite, we, we haven't quite appreciated yet. So like mobilizing around the idea of the diversity strike, understanding diversity labor as labor that can be withheld, leveraged and used in, in, in different directions and actually thinking about how you mobilize around that cross systemically for different kinds of purposes because you know those institutions are competing with each other to comparatively produce diversity and so you can kind of play them against each other strategically as well. I think that that might be one way of thinking about how to bring different parts of the movements together and think about how to build momentum um, on, on the return. I think stuff around international students actually functions similarly. And it was one of the parts of the Santa Cruz organizing that was really impressive, right? That it kind of undercut the typical administrative move of breaking up organizing by threatening international students. So having international students front and center organizing on their own behalf um, is really useful and does, and does a similar thing to kind of threaten to undercut the bottom line for institutions that are so dependent upon international student money. Um, when international students are organizing, particularly students from China and India where the universities are primarily recruiting, that is a terrifying thing for the institution. So I guess, um, so the, that gets national press or international press that can have a giant implications for the future of the institutions. So along the diversity strike specifically, thinking on the international level of kind of how that might play out. Sorry. 
going to mute myself because folks. I, I have a question here that came in from Justin K. It's kind of a long, um, a long statement, and he's kind of, um, but I'll read it out. Um, um, related to Karen and Marcelo's concerns, I'm interested in hearing thoughts on specific models of organizing strategies and tactics that obtain short-term substantive gains, such as cost of living adjustment, but that also resist recuperation in the university's mechanisms of reproduction. Specifically, I'm concerned about how much of what falls under the banner of COLA as a movement is rhetorically critical of the university while unintentionally materially investing in the maintenance of a surplus that is imperative for the university's current mode of accumulation by austerity. Recently, partially as a result of changed conditions due to COVID, partially as a consequence of internally strategy shifts, <clears throat> it seems that some campaigns under the banner of COLA have been developing and maintaining resources that are materially useful to the university, but that do not require the investment of the university. Nevertheless, they become operationalized to sustain and advance accumulation, even as they might nominally be positioned against it. Things like strike, university office hours, mutual aid, and social welfare strike, these might in many ways be necessary, but I worry that they, they allow the university to maintain itself by securing instructional continuity, tuition payments, rent payments, and a precarious pool for exploitation. In other words, how does centering the work of mutual aid and public education through tactics that essentially subsidize administrative austerity run the risk of stabilizing the mode of accumulation on which the university currently depends as a site of capital accumulation and settler colonial dispossession? What strategies can be imagined that undermine or abolish the structural relations upon which the institution depends rather than concretize them with the rhetoric of the public university or democratizing the university while using already precarious or non remunerated labor, i.e. the non-circulation of wages that are specifically critiqued in your piece? What are strategies that instead center expropriation of resources that both systematically challenge accumulation while also ensuring the ability to support the communities most targeted by its violence? The early work of People's Coalition of UCSC comes to mind, but I'm curious to hear your thoughts. And, and just to add to that, something that, that at Davis we've been thinking about really is how do we actually think about labor beyond just the transactional mode? Like where is like desire and like how do we rethink labor also in terms of like value and desire? And because for Strike You for so many of us is a way of actually doing the labor that we love, uh, which is teaching and learning and being in community and learning in community, right? So how how do we actually not will let the university frame what labor means uh, as well is something that we're grappling with. I mean, I think like one, one place to start is just I one I don't know <laughs> like I I think that it's one hundred percent valid question like you know how can we do this without doing this <laughs> I don't know if we can <laughs> um, like I think that, like this is we are like we are the contradictions like we can't like we like we exist within the contradictions and we move within the contradictions. I don't, I don't think we can lose them, but like there's no intentionality that will, that will take us outside of the contradictions and not, I, there's no strategy. Anytime that you do work that it, like, so I'm grad director in, my, in the feminist studies department, right? Like, and so what we recruited our recruitment this year was 100%. Uh, like every student we offered admission to was was recruited to successfully to to Santa Cruz. 
Um, that has to do with a lot of factors, but part of it has to do with the fact that students were attracted to Santa Cruz based on the fact that we were on strike. <laughs> Um, and so, like, ha like in some ways, like, th the strike should have shown to people that we, like, you know, Santa Cruz grad school is real messed up. And, like, in, if some of the leverage that, that that strike had, it would have been really great to show that, like, yeah, like, Santa Cruz can't pull in new grad students because of the very contradictions of that, that inhabits. But that, in, that, that very profile becomes the way in which Santa Cruz starts accumulating new students. <laughs> and so I don't like, it, it's not a really, I think that part of being attentive and being vigilant to the force of those contradictions is something that we can work on. I, but I just do not. And if someone knows how to, how, to, how to inhabit the university in such a way that the contradictions are not there, um, I like. I would love to know, um, but every time that you, it's it's the same thing I was saying again about like words being in someone else's mouth. Um, every time that you do something that is um, that's powerful <laughs> with, within the university, it's subject to appropriation by people. Like you know, I, I was saying like if, if we got the cola at Santa Cruz. Like 10 years later, the administration would be advertising Santa Cruz as the place where the COLA started. And even now, even without the COLA, they'll probably still be, be advertising Santa Cruz as the place where the COLA campaign started. Um, and so j just because that, that's the, those are the, the contradictions that we inhabit, the um, institution both resists violence and has the accumulative pull that, 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 that is its own force. And I don't think that there's a way of actually having, uh, of, of guaranteeing that we don't operate in them, except to uh, do, like, be good, historically-minded activists <laughs> and uh, to understand and to prepare for the force of the contradictions that we will encounter, not if we lose, but it even especially if we win. Um, and I think that, like, yeah, I, I don't know if folks have other thoughts around that, but I, it's something that I struggle with all the time. I write about black studies. <laughs> like, you know, what happens when the university that you resist all of a sudden wants you and like stakes its legit, legitimacy, legitimacy on you. And so your opposition yesterday is not your opposition today. Um, it's your employer today. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think it's a, a great question. I just don't know how to deal with it. So picking up on what, what Nick said, um, maybe one, one strategy uh, could be to create situations that heighten those contradictions and force more people to um, uh, collaborate with you in in grappling with and studying and organizing around those contradictions for for example one 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 way um might be to use your classes as spaces of organizing um and, and to invite uh people involved in radical um, organizing outside of and and in the campus to collaborate with you and your students in those classes um, like like for example make make your your classes spaces where the students would, would be doing research um, with and for um, your uh, your grad worker union um, strike organizing or, or with your uh, ten, local tenants union um, and so, so the students would be doing research that's useful for that and or, or, or organizing with uh, your local um, critical resistance or, or other um, prison abolitionist um, and police abolitionist uh, groups to um, uh, organize to uh, kick police off of campus and replace them with transformative justice um, practices. Um, for example, so, so those, those would be ways that lots of this contradictions would would be heightened within the space of your classroom. Um, of course, it's very hard to um, deal with 
those kinds of contradictions on your own. So, so this kind of strategy would, would need to be a kind of shared pedagogical strategy that, that you and your fellow um, uh, instructors could come up with together and strategize about how to do that um, across your classes, maybe. Thank you. Thank you all for um, for all the thinking with us about this, because I guess, as you said, this is just the beginning point, and it's about trying these things. Um, one of the things that we do want to do through the abolitionist place that we're trying to get to strike you is to, is to use this as a way to study together, um, really, um, in the way that, uh, that Moten and Harney talked about, really, is like, uh, study so that we can actually build these networks and build these strategies together. Um, and so, um, and so I, I think that is that is the kind of desire that I'm I'm talking about. Like the desire, where's the desire um, to organize? Like how do we actually account for the labor that goes into organizing? And that is a desire that we have, uh, right? And so, how do we account for those kinds of desires within this space uh, that Strike You offers? Um, and so, I mean, in some ways, this is an invitation uh, to folks to join us in um, in learning, um, in studying together around abolition. Um, we'll put a call out through Strike You for a series of teach-ins or reading groups that are specifically around the abolitionist university studies, and maybe from there, particular strategies for resistance and for organizing can can come out. So, just wanted to share that. Um, Any last words that I know we, we have a minute left in our session? Um, anything anyone wants to share before we? I know one concrete project that we're envisioning at UC Davis is to try to use the knowledge production that we're talking, or not even knowledge, that's the wrong word, study that we're proposing to do together through Strike University to potentially disrupt or shut down the $34 million ICE and jail expansion project that they've proposed in um, Yolo County. So trying to think about the direct ways to link our study with a, like an immediate um, of, of application that undergrads and grads alike um, can learn to, to put this stuff into practice. So thank you for your theory today. Um, if folks are interested in, in helping us to think through what a decarcerate Yolo County campaign could look like and modeled across other counties, um, we can continue that conversation later. Thank you. Yes, and this session is recorded, so we'll put it up so we can, we can go back to it. And um, we'll be in touch um, again with uh, further developments. And, and maybe at some point, it would be great to have a reconvening uh, with a much more kind of specific um, task at hand that maybe we can all kind of think through. Um, so thank you all very much. Thank you, Rana. Thank you, Tim, uh, for helping put this all together. Thank you, Eli. Thank you, Abby, Zach, and Nick. Um, and thank you to all for participating in this event. Thank you, Anuj. Thank you.
Hello, wonderful people. Oh, are we still recording? Is it editable?